Well, welcome back to our killer discussion of kinetics. In this video, we're going to look at collision theory, an explanation of what factors affect reaction rates, and the Arrhenius equation. Uh, <clears throat> and so now our major things that we're going to talk about here is the kinetic molecular theory, and just reminding us that that means that our temperature in Kelvin is proportional to our average molecular kinetic energy. We discussed this when we talked about uh, gases and the um, pressures that they exert at certain temperatures. We're going to talk about molecular collision orientation, uh, how they have to be oriented when a reaction occurs, uh, collision energy and activation energy. And we're going to see that maybe this collects back to our molecular theory. Um, then kinetic, molecular kinetic frequency of uh, the collisions, and then the Arrhenius equation. Okay. Let's start with some foundational uh, information we're talking about collision theory. Um, number one, we're going to reference this idea of an effective collision. An effective collision is a collision between reactants that leads to product molecules being formed. So this is a collision between reactants where a reaction actually occurs. Now, what does that mean? That means some collisions between our reactants don't lead to products. So they would be an effective collision. So that means there's some collisions between our reactants where we actually don't get a reaction happening. Um, secondarily, the reaction rate is directly proportional to the number of effective collisions per second. So if we can conceptually understand what factors affect the number of effective collisions per second, that's gonna tell us uh, give us the ability to describe or talk about uh, how our reaction rate is affected by um, these different variables like temperature and concentration, et cetera. Number three, the temperature dependence of the rate constant is defined by the Arrhenius equation. And so we have it down here, the Arrhenius equation K, that's our rate constant. Again, specific to a certain reaction at a certain temperature is equal to A, a is what we're going to call the frequencies factor. And we're going to talk about this uh, as we detail out the different pieces of um, the collision theory. And this is specific to each reaction. So it's dealing basically with the nature of our reactants and the properties that they would have. Uh, then we have our, our gas constant R. We have our activation energy of the reaction. We'll talk about that when we discuss uh, the reaction energies and collisions. Uh, and then the temperature in Kelvin. So what we see here is that our rate constant includes information about the specific nature of our reaction, our activation energy, so again, that's based upon the reaction, and our temperature. So we notice that this gives is gonna tell us a lot of information about uh, our reaction rate based upon those different variables. So now let's start <clears throat> by looking at a specific um, theory that we can see when we're trying to describe or discuss um, how our reaction rates are affected by these different variables. Okay, so we're gonna look at a specific reaction. We're gonna look at this reaction of ozone, O3, reacting with NO to give us NO2 and O2. And so what we've done is we've, we've represented our ozone as in a space filling diagram. That's because our, we have our ozone molecules bonded like that and our nitrous monoxide uh, nitrogen monoxide, and O here, again, with those two things bonded to each other. Now, this reaction is written out that represents an actual collision. Okay, so this is actually representing the collision between ozone and NO to produce NO2 and O2. Um, and so when we say something represents an actual collision, we call that an elementary reaction. So we write this out as an elementary reaction, does elementary reactions represent specific collisions between our reactant molecules? We're going to use this to illustrate the factors that are going to lead to a reaction being faster or slower or going to contribute to this. So now before we do that, let's go ahead and draw out what like NO2 would look like and O2. So O2, we would have um, our oxygen and oxygen here. Okay, so we have our O2 and then we have our nitrogen. We're going to have nitrogen here, and then we're going to have our two oxygen atoms there. Okay, so we have our nitrogen dioxide and O2 
being formed from this reaction. So let's first discuss this idea, how will concentration affect the number of effective collisions? So if we just think if we're inside of a box, we have some container and I have a certain concentration of our maybe gas particles, okay? We then go to, let's just call this a lower concentration. And then we now go to a container with a higher concentration. And now we have all these different particles in here, a lot more particles in there, higher concentration. We think, well, what's that gonna do to the number of effective collisions? Well, as we go from like a lower to a higher concentration, we're increasing the total number of collisions. And that's just simply a statistics game. You throw uh, more particles inside of a container, more particles are gonna collide more often. So what we'll see here is that a higher concentration is gonna to lead to more total collisions among our reactant particles, whatever those would be. Okay, if it's an aqueous solution, maybe they're ions, uh, but we increase the concentration, we increase the total number of collisions. Well, we're gonna talk about, there's a certain fraction of those total collisions that are actually effective. So our concentration really only tells us what is going to affect the total number of collisions. These other variables that we're gonna talk about are gonna tell us, well, of these total number of collisions that we have, how many of them actually lead to a reaction? The first thing we need to feel, think about is um, the collision between our two reactants here. So we're gonna use a space filling diagram just like we did with O3 and NO, and we wanna draw out an orientation where these molecules could collide that could be effective. So we need to think about, well, what bonds are breaking in O3 and what new bonds are forming in NO? So again, we, we draw out, let's say we got our O3, uh, and then we have our NO. So again, we're gonna use this, this uh, teal color for nitrogen and the other ones are gonna be oxygen. Well, those have to collide together in order to form NO2. So that would mean I'm gonna have to, as this reaction occurs, I'm gonna have to break one of those oxygen-oxygen bonds. Could be that oxygen-oxygen bond, it could be a different oxygen-oxygen bond. And then that oxygen is gonna have to bond onto the nitrogen on that side. It's not bonding to the oxygen on the other side. So we wanna think, well, how is orientation gonna affect how fast this reaction happens? They have to collide in a very specific way. They have to collide where we have our O3, and then we have our nitrogen coming and colliding where with this NO molecule collides where now we're going to form that new bond. At the same time, what we're gonna see is that we have the ability to break off that old bond. Okay, so what's important here is that we have to collide in a way where the bonds are broken from the specific atoms needed in our reactant. So that would be here where we're breaking that bond. In addition to that, we also have to collide in a way where our new bonds are correctly oriented. So what do we mean by that? They're correctly oriented by the fact that our nitrogen and oxygen are colliding here, and now they have the ability to share electrons and form a new bond. So that would be one possible orientation where our reaction would be, uh, excuse me, our collision could be affected. Now B, let's think about, well, what would it look like if these would collide and they would never be effective? They're never gonna lead to a reaction. So again, we have maybe our O3 here, but then if we have our NO oriented in a way where now, again, this is our O3 and this is our NO, they're oriented in such a way that yeah, we're maybe gonna break the bond where we need to with our O3. However, our NO2 is not gonna be uh, in an orientation where the oxygen and oxygen are bonded to each other. So here, what we see, this is going to be 
an ineffective reaction, a collision, and that is because we have the wrong orientation. Okay, so now we see our oxygen in the NO is colliding with O3. Well, that's not going to be the right orientation. We're not forming the bond in the right location. So this is not going to be effective, and that is because this new bond is formed on the wrong atom that we would see it needed to be. In this case, it would be formed to our oxygen in NO, not to our nitrogen in NO. Another possible uh, ineffective collision would be maybe if we have our ozone rotated a little bit, but now again, we go ahead and we see we have our nitrogen come and collide here, and then we have our oxygen over here. So we say, okay, well, our nitrogen is now colliding with an oxygen. However, if we look at this, in order for this oxygen to form this new bond here, we're gonna have to break those two oxygens away. Well, if that reaction happened, this would lead to a reaction where we got oxygen atom, oxygen atom, oxygen atom bonded to our, uh, our nitrogen and then our oxygen here. Well, this is not O2 and, and O2. That's not O2, those are two oxygen atoms. So what we've done is we've broken the bonds in the wrong location. So we form the bonds in the right location with our new products. However, what we notice here is that we've broken the bonds in our reactants in the wrong location for this collision. <clears throat> so we notice it's a really important that these two reactants collide in such a way that the correct atom collides with the other correct atom in a different reactant in a way where the new bonds are formed in the right spot. We have this new bond formed in the right spot and our old bonds are for, are broken in the off, in the correct spot. So we see now here we have to have the right orientation for these bonds to break and bonds to form in the correct locations in our new products that we're going to form. So that's one important factor that we need to think about with regards to our molecular orientation and how it contributes to our reaction. So now what I think, how does that relate to maybe our total collisions? What we'll notice is that only a certain fraction of the collisions will have the correct orientation. And there's various ways we can describe this, but what we could say is that there's a certain fraction of those collisions that have the correct orientation. And this is gonna be between zero and one. So one would be 100% of the collisions are perfectly oriented. Zero would be none of the collisions are oriented correctly. So we'll notice for a specific reaction, there's gonna be this certain fraction based upon uh, structure and size, like what are factors gonna affect our orientation fraction? That's gonna be dealt with the size or orientation of our reactant molecules and like how many possible locations can they collide? So for example, if we're thinking about our original reaction, our nitrogen could bond to that oxygen and our nitrogen could bond to that oxygen. So it could bond to either one of them. Whereas if maybe it was not oxygens on both sides of our molecule, uh, maybe it was different uh, and maybe we don't have the ability to collide with either side, that fraction of um, that are going to have the correct orientation would be smaller. And we see that's gonna affect our reaction rate. So then we see molecular orientation is very important here. The next factor that we need to think about is this idea of collision energy. Okay, so collision energy, our molecules are always moving. So they always have some amount of kinetic energy. Well, in order for us to actually start to break and form new bonds, we need to have some store or reservoir of energy to start breaking the bonds in the reactants while the new bonds of the products are simultaneously being formed. Because as we start to break bonds, we're increasing potential energy. So we need to have some reservoir to start breaking these bonds. And that is the kinetic energy of our molecules. And that's converted to potential energy as these bonds start to form. So when we have two molecules collide, they are going to transfer their movement energy, kinetic energy, into that stored bond energy of potential energy. Well, this barrier that we need to overcome, the kinetic energy barrier, 
is what we call our activation energy. So think we need to activate this reaction. In order for us to activate the reaction, we need to have enough energy, enough kinetic energy, enough movement energy to be able to overcome that activation energy, that barrier, that um, kind of fence in the way for us to get from reactants to products. Now, how does this relate to maybe something like temperature? So again, reminding us, we talked about this idea when we talked about kinetic energy, molecular kinetic energy, there's always a distribution of kinetic energies. And so if we were to look at our colder sample here and hotter sample here, um, this is maybe for the same substance. What we'll notice is that as we go from our colder to our hotter sample, so that's like a lower temperature to a higher temperature, what we notice is that with our higher temperature sample that we have more faster moving molecules. So we know that the faster moving molecules are going to have a higher uh, collision kinetic energy, uh, but also these faster moving molecules, we could think, how is that going to relate to maybe the number of collisions that they would have as these molecules are moving around? So if we increase the temperature how is that going to affect the total number of uh, collisions with a uh, kinetic energy greater than their activation energy? So if we increase the temperature, what that means is now uh, what we've done is we've kind of increased the number of particles that have a collision energy greater than what is needed or this barrier. So for example, if we were to say this right here was our activation energy barrier, uh, and we're dealing with our collision kinetic energy and the number of collisions that are at that kinetic energy. Well, now what we see is maybe at our higher temperature, uh, or assuming our lower temperature, we can think of the area under that curve would correspond to the number of collisions or the fraction of collisions that would be uh, having enough kinetic energy to overcome that barrier. Or if we think of the hotter temperature, the area under that curve would be the number of collisions or fraction of collisions that are, have a kinetic energy greater than our barrier or activation energy. So we think increasing the temperature is going to increase the fraction of collisions with a kinetic energy of that collision greater than this basically this activation energy barrier. Now what does that mean for us as we're thinking about this idea of um, reaction rates and all of that, we'd see that increasing the temperature, because it does increase the fraction or percent of these collisions that have enough kinetic energy to overcome this activation energy, that's going to increase our reaction rate because now we will have more effective collisions. We will have more collisions with enough kinetic energy to overcome this activation energy barrier. So increasing the temperature it's going to increase the fraction of collisions that will have enough energy to overcome this activation energy. Also, if we think about this idea of faster moving particles, if we increase the temperature, like that's our major consequence that we'd see here. If we increase the temperature, we're also increasing the total number of collisions between uh, these particles. Now, why would we say that? We would say that because our particles are moving faster, and because they're moving faster, they're more likely to collide with each other, simply just because the time between uh, different collisions is going to be shorter, so we'll have more collisions. And so those two factors are going to lead to an increased reaction rate, because we'll have a greater uh, effective collision rate per unit time, maybe per second. So let's think about this idea of temperature. Now, if we bring it down to our next idea here, um, how will the value of the activation energy affect the number of effective collisions at constant temperature? So now if we go back to maybe our diagram up here, and now we look at maybe a different activation energy. Let's say we're comparing this higher activation energy with the lower activation energy. Well, now if we look at maybe our hotter temperature, we look at the area under the curve has decreased or the fraction has decreased. Additionally, now we only have a very small amount for our lower temperature. And so what we see here is real important is we're thinking about this idea of activation energy. 
is that a higher activation energy means a lower fraction or percent of collisions with this necessary uh, factor being true, the the, num the collision kinetic energy is greater than our activation energy. So both that has to be true in order for this um, this reaction to possibly take place. Uh, and so we say vice versa, a lower uh, activation energy means a higher fraction or a faster rate. So if we're thinking here, higher activation energy would lead to a slower rate if we're thinking of all other variables, constant temperature, concentration, uh, etc. So we're thinking about this idea of activation energy. Important thing to think about, as we mentioned already, is that activation energy is dependent on what our reaction is. So it's not going to change if we're thinking about the same reaction unless we change something like a catalyst, and we'll talk about that at a different point. So again, that's based upon the reaction nature. Uh, our third thing we want to think about is, will every collision that has enough kinetic energy lead to an effective collision? And one thing that we need to think about is that both these two um, restrictions must be met. Number one, we must have the correct collision orientation. That's where we collide where the new bonds are being formed and where the old bonds are being broken. And the activation energy uh, must be met or the fact that our collision um, kinetic energy has to overcome this activation energy. So both must be true for us to have an effective collision. So those two variables must be met. If only one is met, then we're not going to have um, a, an effective collision. So for example, if I do have the correct orientation, but then this is not met, we, we don't have enough energy to break those bonds and start forming our new bonds, we're not going to have an effective collision and vice versa. So we see that those are two things we can think about when we're trying to understand and explain how fast reactions occur. Now, one important thing that we can think about as we're trying to discuss what is activation energy and how does it relate to an overall uh, reaction for maybe something like this uh, elementary reaction. And we can illustrate this by looking at a potential energy diagram. So here we have the same reaction we've been looking at. And again, we mentioned that it's an elementary reaction. We have the enthalpy change for this reaction. And our potential energy diagram is gonna illustrate reaction coordinate, so as we go from reactants to products, and the potential energy of those reactants and products as they undergo this reaction. And so when we're, when we're looking at this, we can label a bunch of different things. We can label the potential energy of the reactants, the products, the enthalpy change, the activation energy, this idea of an activated complex, and our transition state. So let's go ahead and discuss what each of those would mean. So again, we're talking about the potential energy of our reactants. So here we have our reactants. And again, we can illustrate what each of those are. We have our ozone and we have our nitrogen monoxide. So those are our two reactants. Uh, and so we can label exactly what those are and we can label that's our characteristic, what we call reactant condition. And then we would be able to label also the potential energy of our products. So once you go ahead and pause the video and identify, will we be in condition one up here or condition two down here where we have a higher or lower potential energy. So go ahead and pause the video and predict what you think would happen. So now after you pause the video, hopefully you realized we need to look at our enthalpy change to tell us something about are we going from a lower to a higher potential energy or a higher to lower potential energy. And so what we would see here, because we have a negative potential, uh, a negative enthalpy change, that lets us know we're gonna decrease in potential energy. We're gonna release energy here. And so we're gonna end up with our products down here. So we end up at a lower potential energy for our products and our products are O2 and NO2. Okay, so those are our two products. And we could say, well, the difference between these here, if I were to kind of draw a line over here and think about the difference between those, the difference in potential energy, that's gonna be equal to our enthalpy change. So a negative enthalpy change means to go from a higher to a lower potential energy. So we've labeled the potential energy of our reactants, the potential energy of our products, the enthalpy change. So now let's go ahead and identify what we would say is our activation energy. So now as we go from reactants to products, 
we have to overcome this hump or barrier. And so we don't necessarily go directly from uh, our reactants to products. There's not this direct path. There's actually this, this hump that we need to overcome as we think we're going from reactants to products. And this barrier or energy needed to being uh, overcome is what we classify as our activation energy. So that's this barrier that we need to overcome. Now, where do we get that energy from? We get that energy from the collision of these particles where we can convert our kinetic energy, the movement energy, to potential energy, which is our activation energy. So now as we've hit this place where we've gone from, we're moving up this potential energy, uh, we're gonna see that up here, just like we can label uh, our products or our reactants, we can also label what does that, those species look like when they collide with each other. And that's what we're gonna call our activated complex. And our activated complex is where we have the process of where we started breaking our bond that we're having our reactants and started forming our bond in our product. So again, we are breaking maybe that bond there and that's gonna form a bond here. And so now we're, this is where we've started to form uh, our new bond. And here is where we're starting to break the bond in our reactants, where we're going to now get rid of that bond and it's going to form a new bond somewhere, right, somewhere else. This whole species right here is what we call the activated complex. So it's a complex because it's these two molecules that are together. And it's activated because what we've done is we've given it more energy to get it to this place now where we've, we've gone higher than the potential energy of just our reactants and products separate from each other. And this state or conditions right here is what we call the transition state. And the transition state is a place where we look at, well, can we go, or can we transition down to and form our products? Or could we just transition back and stay with our reactants? And so it's this place for now where we're at kind of this tipping point or the top of the mountain where we're now we can either go down one side or down the other side and lead to our products being formed where we could see a reaction occur or going back to our reactants. And so now we see that we've labeled our transition state, activated complex, activation energy, enthalpy change, potential energy, and potential energy of our products and reactants here. So this is our potential energy diagram. We have the ability to identify these things. And if I was gonna, for example, draw out my activated complex, I gotta know what is the orientation of our collision before I can even do this. Otherwise, I don't actually know where are my bonds being broken and where are my bonds being formed. So now they see that this helps us kind of illustrate graphically uh, the relationship between activation energy and the potential energy of our reactants and products separate from each other. <clears throat> So now what we want to do is come, we're going to close this up with a discussion thinking about um, the idea of the Arrhenius equation and how this K value expresses the factors discussed in our collision theory ideas. So again, we think about our K value is equal to uh, this pre-exponential factor times E to the negative EA over RT. And so there's a couple of things that we discussed uh, when we talked about collision theory. Number one is that we think of the fraction of our collisions with the correct orientation. And so we think of, well, the fraction of our collisions with the correct orientation, where would that be accounted for in our rate constant? Because they, there has to be some something that affects our overall rate and our rate constant is expressed in our rate law. And what we'll notice is that this is included in that pre-exponential factor, where it's saying there's a certain fraction based upon the nature of our reaction, and specifically what our reactants are, kind of thinking about what their structure is, <clears throat> what fraction of them is gonna have this correct orientation based upon maybe uh, how they spin or what kind of atoms need to collide with each other. Is there only one small section of a molecule that can collide with another small section of another molecule and all the other collisions that happen of the other parts of the molecule uh, that don't collide are not going to lead to a reaction. So we'll see that that's included in this pre-exponential factor. 
Number two is we also think about this as number the total collision frequency. So how fast uh, these molecules are colliding with each other. And again, that's maybe dealing with the nature of our reactants. Are they in maybe the liquid phase or the gas phase? Or maybe is it heterogeneous where we have a solid and a liquid or solid and a gas? And again, that is also included in uh, this pre-exponential factor that's kind of built into that in the kind of the physical states or the nature of it. So we'll notice this A value includes the principal nature of the reactants and products. Next, we also talked about this idea of our activation energy. And what we'll notice is that our activation energy is included in this whole component here, the E to the negative EA over RT. And so what we'll see here is that we'll, an, an increase, actually let's look something like where we add a catalyst, and our next video is gonna focus on what a catalyst is and how this works. That is going to possibly decrease the overall activation energy of a step in our reaction. And by decreasing that activation energy, what that's gonna do is that's gonna give us a smaller activation energy value which will give us a larger negative EA over RT because we make this negative value, negative exponent smaller. That's going to give us a larger activation energy, or excuse me, a larger E to the negative E over RT. And what that will mean is that we will have a larger K value. So we'll see adding a catalyst actually changes the K value, just like um, maybe changing the temperature, which we'll see as well. We'll also, we, we also talked about temperature and how our temperature uh, is affecting our reaction rate. And again, we bring this back to our rate constant. And again, this is built inside of this E to the negative EA over RT value. And so we'll see is that if we increase temperature, that's going to decrease this value here of negative EA over RT which is going to increase the relative value that we'd have a smaller negative exponent, meaning a larger, smaller negative exponent because it gives us a larger number and that's gonna to lead to a larger K value. So we notice two important things here is that our activation energy, if we change our activation energy or we change the temperature, that leads to, both of these lead to a change in our K value, which is which is expressed in our rate constant, uh, which our, our rate constant is expressed in our rate law expression. And so we'll see that this helps us identify those variables that affect our overall reaction rate.